you know how I like to have a theme. So I'll keep this theme going with another old-timey player. He wasn't born in the 1800s like Ed Griffin, but close. So let's go. There's been plenty of players who finished their careers with the team they started out with. Players bounce around and come back. That's nothing new. And there's been quite a few guys who were active players in pro ball for 20 plus years and then stuck around for another 20 plus working with the club in one way or another. Even that isn't too special. But when you've been associated with one team as a player, a coach, or as the bat boy since the beginning of the 20th century until the end of that century and still wearing the uniform in an official capacity, meaning you're getting paid to put the uniform on. Now that is special. Who else can say that? Sure, former players and coaches will put on the uniform for a one-time event like an old-timers game or an opening day first pitch, maybe a re jersey retirement ceremony. But only this person was paid to put on that uniform every season for parts of nine decades. So let's go back 125 years to New York. It's 1901, and James Herman Solomon is born. This is the first year of the American League and seven years before Seven years before the first Model T car was sold. In the day of his second birthday, the Pittsburgh Pirates beat the Boston Americans in the first ever World Series game. As a kid, he was watching the players who were involved in the Black Sox scandal play ball in the Pacific Coast League. This was four years before those scoundrels were in on the fix and played in those infamous World Series games. Pretty much right from the start, he's been around to see it all. This energetic little blonde kid with a big smile was a real go-getter and would soon move to San Pedro, California with his widowed mom and little sister. As soon as he was old enough to sell newspapers, he became the family's breadwinner, hawking papers everywhere he could, including to the sailors down at the port. A little while later, with World War I looming, construction started on the San Pedro Naval Base, and this little kid wound up living on base. Again, running around, selling papers, but now in an unofficial sailor's uniform. But he was the official mascot on the base's championship team. Ever since he was little, he used to make time to sneak into L.A. Angels practices and make himself useful. So useful, in fact, that by 1917, Angels manager Frank Chance would give the teenager a dollar and a ball every Sunday for being the team's mascot. That's what they used to call bat boys at the turn of the century. He would spend the next six years as the Angels' mascot. And yes, he did play ball on his high school team, but would quit school, lie about his age, and hit the road playing semi-pro ball. And to avoid the prejudice that was prevalent at the time against Jewish ball players, this teenager made the choice to change his last name. He chose the name Reese. And by doing that, he became AKA Jimmy Reese, infielder, MLB debut, 1930. Jimmy first signed with the Oakland Oaks of the Pacific Coast League in 1923, and from the start he was known as a flashy, acrobatic second baseman and would soon become one of their star players and a fan favorite. Known for making an easy play look difficult and then spectacular, he played five seasons with Oaks and was on their 1927 PCL championship team, hitting 295 and leading the league in field percentage. That same year, he was traded to the Yankees, along with Lynn Laurie and Hunter Grand. That's 1.2 million today. Jimmy Reese was called up to the bigs in 1930 and would don the famous Yankee pinstripes. He did real good with the Yanks, batting 386 and striking out only eight times. Only Lou Gehrig and Babe Ruth hit better. Speaking of Babe Ruth, it's at this time Jimmy was paired up with the Bambino when the Yankees were on the road. And the story goes, Jimmy Reese wasn't Babe Ruth's roommate. He was roommates with Babe's suitcase which sounds about right knowing what we know about the Sultan of Swat. He liked to party and have a good time. Yet Jimmy says a lot of the stories about him were overblown by the newspapers and has only good things to say about one of the most famous and popular sport players at the time. Babe took a shine to Jimmy, treating him like a little brother and would often bring him home for dinner or take Jimmy with him for a night out on the town. Fun times, I can only imagine. Jimmy Reese was the Yankees' backup second baseman behind Hall of Famer Tony Lazeri, but after the 1931 season, the Yankees sent him down to the St. Saint Paul Saints to complete a deal made weeks prior. But he'd be right back up in the majors that same season when he was picked up off waivers by the St. Louis Cardinals and would play 90 games for the club in 1932. The L.A. Angels would buy Jimmy off the cards before the start of the 33 season. 
and he played well during his four years with the Angels, but was traded again in 1937 to another PCL team, the San Diego Padres, and on that team was a 19-year-old Ted Williams. This was Jimmy's last full season playing pro ball. That Padres team won the Governor's Cup with Jimmy batting 314. He would finish up his playing days back with the LA Angels in 1940 and would stay on as a coach until 1942. That's when he joined the Army, spending the next two years at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, managing baseball teams. And when the war was over, spent two seasons scouting for the Boston Braves before coming back home to California to, to do a long stint as coach for the Padres from 1948 until 1960. It was in 1956 when my dad got a couple of Jimmy Reese's autographs, one in his autograph book and then another time on a SEALs scorebook. Jimmy Reese was promoted to manager for the first time in his career. When he was tapped by the Padres to take over for Catfish Mekovic to start the 1961 season, but he would resign halfway through the season saying, I'm just not suited to give a guy hell and preferred to coach instead of manage. The rest of the 60s would see Jimmy spending time coaching in Hawaii, Seattle, and Portland before coming back to the big leagues in 1970 to scout for the Montreal Expos, working with their manager and his longtime friend, Gene Mock. After that season, Jimmy came back to Southern California to roost for good, or so it seemed, now retired and with no family to speak of what to do. Baseball was Jimmy Reese's whole life ever since childhood. As a kid, he started scrapbooking. Then he started playing ball. He would keep and collect all sorts of game memorabilia, anything you can think of. He also collected photos and letters and autographs from some of the most famous people in baseball history, including his so-called roommate, Babe Ruth. Every room in Jimmy's house was filled with past memories that he would give away, apparently, without a second thought. He kept his favorite possessions in a workshop in his backyard. A lot of that stuff was from his childhood and is full of pinholes. This was the year he would spend a lot of time in that workshop making custom frames for a variety of items that he would give to his friends as gifts. But as the saying goes, he wasn't ready for the easy chair. And at the age of 71 and a year out of baseball, he didn't want to put his feet up. He wanted to put his cleats on. So in 1972, Jimmy Reese asked for a job with his old team, the L.A. Angels, who are now a major league team called the California Angels. And believe it or not, the guy who was years past the age of retirement would be hired as a conditioning coach. So Jimmy dusted off his spikes and put back on the Angels uniform, just like he did some 60 years prior when he was the L.A. Angels mascot. So now Jimmy is the Angels' new conditioning coach, and he sees a player standing around. So coach tells him, grab his glove and feel some fungos. Didn't take long before this young pitcher was out of breath, sweating, and about ready to hurl. And I don't mean the ball. The youngster was only saved when the pitching coach called for him. That's how pitcher Nolan Ryan met conditioning coach Jimmy Reese. They both came to the Angels in 1972, and the old-timer and the young pitcher would form a close relationship that lasted until Mr. Reese passed away. Nolan Ryan admired him so much, he named his son Reese and said this about Jimmy Reese. He's the finest human being I've ever met. Another big admirer of Jimmy was California Angels owner Gene Autry, who was also a huge baseball fan and gave Jimmy a lifetime contract with the team. Coach Reese was known around the league for hitting fungos at practice with a fungo bat he made himself, and his ability to place the ball using this type of bat was so good he would sometimes use it to pitch batting practice. He would stand on the mound and proceed to hit strikes over the plate using a fungo bat. Jimmy Reese was inducted into the Pacific Coast Hall of Fame in 2003 and was picked as the second baseman on its all-time team. That's a big honor. He holds a couple of PCL records for fielding, and more than a few people compared his style with Hall of Famer Eddie Collins. Jimmy Reese has seen, played with, or coached some of the most famous and infamous players in the sport. Spending over eight decades in pro ball, he was always known as one of the nicest guys in baseball. Loved by all the kids, and year after year, he would receive the Good Guy Award. 
Just after he passed away in 1994, he lay in state wearing his Angels uniform. The club would retire his number 50 and then put him in their Hall of Fame. Two days after Jimmy died, a Walt Disney movie came out called Angels in the Outfield about a little kid who loved baseball and would sneak into Angels games. A year after his death, the Angels encased Jimmy Reese's locker in tinted plexiglass and in that locker hangs his Angels uniform and his favorite fungal bat. He was an Angels coach for 22 years and at the time of his death, Jimmy Reese was said to be the oldest player in the history of North American baseball to wear the uniform in an official capacity. For the last 22 seasons of his life, he was getting up every day, putting on his spikes and going to the park to do what he loved to do. And even at the ripe old age of 92, Jimmy Reese was being paid to wear that uniform right up until the day he died. <laughs>